Okay, we're about to get started on another painting today. This one is a painting of the Great White Throne in Zion National Park. And the Great White Throne is probably one of the most uh, famous uh, rocks in the park. It's pictured on, on logos and, and postcards and things about the park. So it's pretty typical uh, view that uh, every visitor to the park would see when they go down in the canyon along the Virgin River. So. Uh, I've got a photograph here I want to look at and, and show it to you. Now this particular photograph that I've got here was uh, done in the winter time. Okay, so everything is pretty sparse. We see some snow up on the cliff here. I'm going to change this to an autumn scene. I often make changes in the photographs that I use for reference. I do some sketches and uh, try to plan things out and, and know visually, have a little visual roadmap before I get started. So as I look at this, I see that, that uh, I've got a photograph that I like. Uh, I was there. Uh, I like the light coming from this particular side. It defines some of these shapes putting the shadows on this side, a little bit of cast shadow over here. All this is, is uh, has some reflected light and some warms back in the form shadows. And I like how this uh, part of the cliff across the canyon kind of silhouettes it. In this little thumbnail study, I planned where the clouds are going to come and, and uh, come, come down through this side and kind of show off a little more drama on the light, on this lighted side of the cliff. And... Um, as we look at this, uh, I can see in my own mind's eye how this is going to turn out. Uh, but I'm going to use this as reference because now I've got some dark darks, some middle values, and some light lights. And those are the three things we need to look at when we're doing a painting. We want to make sure we've got the values covered and that there's a nice range of values between light and dark. That's the thing that's going to make this painting sparkle and really jump. So I'd like to say a word about my paints. I'm using Daniel Smith paints, and I've got my uh, palettes. Uh, I have two Elda John palettes, and they're arranged according to uh, cool down one side along with the earths, and also the, um, the warms, which are yellows, oranges, reds, and so forth, uh, along the other side. You could set it up however you want to, but this is the way I like to do it. So I've got this all ready to go now. I've got my paper tape down and uh, I'm using Daniel Smith paints. And uh, I, I primarily use them. Others are, are certainly good, but I've been using that brand for many, many years. So I'm using my, uh, my one inch Aquarelle uh, synthetic brush here to lay in the sky wash. So I'm wetting the entire sky area with clear water. And the paper I'm using is Arches 140 pound. Uh, it's a cold press sheet and I just have it taped down with artist tape. But you'll notice that as I'm painting, I'm staying away from the mountain shape and I'm just coming around the outside uh, rim of that. So whatever I put in this wet into wet area is going to be confined to that space. So I'm soaking it down very, very well and uh, as I'm working on this. And I, you can see the shine of the paper. So I'm going to let that settle in just slightly. Then I'm going to paint the sky using these three colors. Yellow ochre, cadmium red light, and ultramarine blue. I'm going to put the yellow down first, and then the red, and then the blue. Now, what I'm painting is the cloud area, not the uh, blue of the sky. So, uh, you can see that I can cut in very easily with this brush and stay away from those edges. But uh, this is a fantastic part about watercolor, is that you can lay one color on top of another on this wet surface, and have those pigments mingle and blend. And that's the technique we want to use here. So with this yellow ochre, cadmium red, and light blue, or ultramarine blue, we're going to lay those down in this sequence. So here comes the red, and it's going to go on top, not next to, but on top of the yellow. Well, what's that going to do? That's going to make kind of an orange. But what's happening is I'm not mixing the orange on my palette. 
I'm allowing the pigments to blend on the paper. And that's the, the key technique in watercolor to achieve wonderful, wonderful blends and a lot of vibrancies that people like about watercolors. So after I got this orange down, now I'm going to start to bring in my blue. So what's going to happen? I'm going to create a gray by combining this blue with the other colors. But they're going to, the, the pigment's going to do the work, not me. So here we go. I'm just dropping that blue on top of the mix I already have. And they're going to just mingle on the paper. And watch this now as I bring a little bit more blue in here. Remember, this is the cloud shape. Uh, not the sky area that we're painting. So we're trying to achieve this gray. And I'm tipping the board so that it can, the, the pigment can move in more than one direction. It's slightly tipped up towards us right now um, for filming uh, reasons, but I can tip that board around any direction that I want to to allow those paints to run and mingle. So there we've got basically these three passages of clouds and that pigment's going to continue to move. It's also going to continue to lighten up as it uh, begins to dry. That's just a characteristic of watercolor. Well, now I'm just going to touch in a little bit of quinacridone coral, uh, which is a cooler red, and I'm going to touch a little bit of that down in the, this bottom part right here, and pretty much where I want the darker part of the shadow uh, to be. And then I'll come in in a minute, and I'll add a little more blue, uh, ultramarine blue, to darken it up, because it's darker than what's there. So now I'll just grab some of that and bring it over. Okay, here we go. We're going to start painting in the blue of the sky with straight ultramarine. Uh, very, very thick. Oops, I can see that my tape is coming up here, so that's why I had to tighten it up. But here we go. I'm just using a, a smaller brush here. This is about an eight. And um, I'm bringing the blue of the sky. Now watch what happens here. It's kind of magical. In a way, it's negative painting, painting the darks to reveal the lights. So now you can see that by putting that blue down, I've created those cloud shapes. I'll bring the blue over here and kind of keep working that with this brush. I want the edges to be ragged, and it's starting to dry a little bit. So instead of just all that pigment just running, it's holding in its position pretty well. And that way I get these nice, soft edges come right up here on the corner here of the cliff and blend it up into this area at the top. So I'll grab a couple of other spots where the blue is going to show through here and let that uh, just drift down right up against this edge here. And uh, as, we, as we do this, you can see the blue of the sky and you can see uh, the cloud shapes. But right now the edges look a little bit hard. But as, as uh, this dries down, it's going to all just kind of melt together in a beautiful soft uh, pattern. And the grays that we have for the clouds are just nice and soft and, uh, and, and beautiful. And that's what we want to achieve. Just touch up this area a little bit and just darken it slightly. Generally, the sky is darker at the top, um, up towards the zenith, and it tends to get a little bit lighter as it goes down. Uh, there's not much transition here, but that's kind of, of how it works. Just darken up a couple of these areas on the underside of the cloud, and we'll, we're almost wrapped up with that. So here we go. We've got uh, 
opportunity now to, as that sky begins to dry down, I'll start working on this cliff. Now, what I like to do is I like to get color over my whole paper and uh, get a, a light value of, of the basic colors down. Uh, in the case of these cliffs, uh, uh, we know that they're going to be have a certain warmness to it, but it has a certain uh, a blue cast as well. So I'm going to use a combination of colors as I start this. But again, I like to work um, from warm to cool and, of course, light to dark. And so I'm just going to use a, a, about an 8 brush here. Uh, this is a, a, just a synthetic brush. Uh, any, any will do, really. I'm very hard on my brushes. But I'll just kind of scumble along with, uh, with my brush here and use a variety of yellows and oranges and reds to give some... I'm, I'm trying to build texture and color variety uh, underneath. And this will even dry lighter than it is. So this will take a little bit of... of um, uh, of the white of the paper away so I could start to compare my values a little bit easier. So these will still be the lighter values and they'll be the lighter values that show through after I come back in with some other glazes over the top of that and create the, the texture and the, the feeling of jagged edges and the cliffs. So you can see that I'm using a little bit of the, the pigment on the right. That would be a Naples yellow yellow ochre and um, then I'll just bring a touch of blue uh, and let that mingle in. Now what that blue does is it pulls in a little bit of the blue from the sky uh, as that cliff goes up and turns against that. We don't want it to be like it's a neon um, light. We don't want colors at their full intensity. So once again I've got yellows reds and now I'm touching blue into that what does it do it dulls it back a little bit it neutralizes uh, the intensity of the colors so I'll just uh, use my pigments at random here uh, most of the edges are soft at this point but I'm just trying to kind of lay in what this is what I would call a block in in oil painting usually block in the darks um, in my technique, uh, I block in the lights and medium values and then work the darks in over the top of that uh, after those have dried. But you can see already the, the variety that I have um, by using this technique. Lots of color showing through in the sky, lots of color showing through in the rocks, and as I begin to build this up with with harder edges later on, you're going to see uh, a, a very, very rich um, darks and very, very rich lights as we build this up. Again, I'm just touching into my reds I'm using are cadmium red light and quinacridone coral, and the yellows are just stained mainly with yellow ochre. But you can see that the pigment, just in the video, how, how quickly it it, uh, it lightens up as it dries. So in some of these darker areas, this is where the form's going to turn. So it's a, a form shadow I'm creating. Now, form shadows are always warmer uh, than a cast shadow. And that's because there's a reflected light that's bouncing off the other cliffs back up into it. So I'm building a fairly warm right now on that side. You'll see it change as we, we move along and the progression of this and uh, hopefully I'll be able to uh, be telling the truth right now when I say that uh, you know this is going to kind of morph into something a lot more uh, detailed than what we're seeing now so I just want to get these things blocked in here and uh, using all three colors red yellow and blue that's what we use for all of this and it, it, it it's it works it's the technique that has been working for for years and years and years for watercolorists over hundreds and hundreds of years and uh, again this is my technique this is this is my approach now see how the colors go back these are still wet so as I put my blue into that 
it reacts to the pigments that are underneath. There is some blending. Now, if I waited too long, if it started to dry a little bit, I would get what, what I call oozles, or these little cauliflower shapes that would, would form when we add water to an already drying pigment. It kind of creates a tsunami that pushes all the, the, the pigment particles away from where the water is. And sometimes that's, that's good. Sometimes it's good to have those uh, things that we often call happy accidents. I prefer not to have any accidents, but uh, watercolor has its way. It does its its own thing, and so it's kind of adds to the charm of, of why people like watercolors. But even still, right now, as you look at the photograph on the upper left there, notice how much more color and warmth I have in my painting than what we're seeing over there. Okay. Now, I'm just going to take clear water and splatter. The purpose of this is to create little spots in, in, the, uh, in the paint, which adds to the texture. That simply, all I'm trying to do is create texture, which I can build later into, uh, into the, the fissures and the cracks and the rocks. Okay, I'll go ahead and bring this, uh, this down along the bottom here. I know there's going to be some grains along here so I'm just adding the blue to the yellow and just kind of darkening up down below and so now I'm going to take the reds again a dark red I'm touching some blue into quinacridone sienna to get the really dark red of this foreground cliff now once I get this down I've got some light values and some medium values I don't have my darkest dark yet but I'm starting to get a range of values so that I can, I can tell where I'm going. And that's why I like to get rid of these whites right off the bat. And, uh, you know, they say all the time in watercolor, preserve the whites. Well, really it's a matter of, of preserving the lights. Constantly using your darks, painting the darks to reveal the light shapes. And as we work down here along this, notice once again, each time I dip my brush back uh, to my palette, I'm grabbing something different so that I can have that variety right off the bat. It's kind of a brown, but how do you get brown? You take some reds and some yellows and mix them together with blue, and then you get this variety. You can see I've touched in a little bit of uh, a green there. That's actually sap green. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't always remember to tell you which colors I'm using as I go into it. But you can see from how I've laid out the palette, my palette description, uh, as I reach for them, which ones I'm using. Uh, and so, again, it's just a variety. Some greens. Here we go, see how that reacts with this uh, yellow ochre adjacent to it. And uh, I also have a kind of a neat color that I'm using here that's quinacridone gold. And uh, it's just a, a richer gold, but a little darker than, than some of the other uh, yellows. But um, I use it all the time. I love the quinacridone colors that uh, Daniel Smith started using them. Uh, way back, and now you can find all the manufacturers with quinacridone colors. So here we have, in just a few minutes, we have basically laid out our painting with the basic colors. I'll splatter some texture and uh, just kind of take a look at this now and, and see where I'm at and see where I'm headed. Just tighten up a couple of these edges, and then uh, then I can really kind of just evaluate where I'm headed next. Uh, a little bit of texture um, created with this splattering. That's clear water into um, an already almost dry glaze. So what we do is we we try to build up the texture and the value, okay? Um, texture really comes uh, closer to the end. 
Right now I'm just smoothing out some edges a little bit and that's just allowing the, the rocks to feel like they turn. And you can see that. You can see how smooth and soft it is. But I need some harder edges than that and as it begins to dry I'm going to build that up. Using a little quinacridone sienna and ultramarine blue and see how I lay my brush on its side? That is what I call scumbling. That allows the, the, the bristles of the brush to kind of bounce over the surface of the roughed paper. And um, that way you get uh, what I think are the, the, the feeling of and the texture of rock. And you can see that as I'm developing it now. So I'm just using some warms and I'm creating texture over the rock and you can just see it shape up. This is one of the greatest techniques I think that there is in working with rock and natural surfaces out in nature. And just be very, very, uh, you can see I'm not loading my brush up very much. Again, a little bit of cornacridone sienna. And, uh, and the blue that I'm using, a dark blue, is ultramarine, as you know. So now I'm working on the form shadow side of this rock down into here. Let's get a little bit of that red. I'm looking it over saying where can I use some of this right now. So it's just kind of to taste, you know, a little salt and pepper to taste. And, and so now I'll go in and work on this uh, foreground rock a little bit. It's adjacent to the Great White Throne. Uh, taking some cadmium red light and I'm scubbling with that. And that's a little bit brighter because it's not back in the shadow area. But it'll be dulled down quick enough. But look at the nice texture you can get through scumbling uh, your brush in this way. I'm using about an 8 or 10 uh, low Cornell uh, brush. That's a brush that holds up pretty well and has a good point, which I don't really need in this technique. But you can see how rough I am on my brushes. Um, I use cheaper brushes and replace them often. I have hundreds and hundreds of brushes that are used, that are still good, but uh, they're more suited uh, to let my grandchildren paint uh, on rocks at our cabin or something like that with. So I've got lots and lots of brushes. Okay, comparing these two now, um, I'm thinking I'll just get up here in this area, right in here, and start to shape this this um, great white throne as it turns. Now this is the delicious area uh, of a, of a cre creating form, especially with watercolor, is that point where the uh, light turns, goes from the light family and starts to turn into the shadow family. Well right along that edge is important. That's where we see detail, more so than anywhere else on the painting. And that's where we show the viewer what the actual texture and shape of that form is. Right here where it turns, that's the key. So you can see I'm darkening up quite a bit and paying some attention right here along this edge and working my way up. And it'll be actually darker than this when, when I finally get down to the, the finished point. But already we can start to feel that rock turn, can't we? So I'll just... Uh, Continue to work here. I need it darker back in the form shadow, but I also want it to stay warm. And it's kind of magical how everything appears, that form shadow. We can use our photo for reference, um, but gosh, there's so much personal taste involved in color uh, that uh, you can make an effective painting using any combination of colors, really. And if you're not trying to exactly match something, which of course I'm not, I'm going from a winter scene to a, an autumn scene, and I'm using my own palette of colors, which is usually very, very warm uh, compared to, to most. So here's this edge right on the corner. I'm grabbing some clear water and touching along this edge right here. And what that does is that turns. It just reaches over and it just rolls over 
now some of the shadow that we see as that rock comes down and juts out. I'll pick that up. But so gradually, uh, in an hour's time or so, we can see this whole form start to build and grow. And uh, just using that brush and watching the form and just uh, just using our brushes in the way that it looks like we need to. I'm, I, we've got crevices, we've got cracks, we've got strata lines, we've got all these things in the rocks that we want to, to bring out, but also the surface texture and also the color. So we're just kind of doing some to taste and some following our, our photograph, but especially following our thumbnail study, which we've got right next to us to look at all the time make sure we're staying true to it. So I'm just playing around with some of the detail up in here now and uh, you know that's kind of the fun part. It, uh, it's uh, for some people it would be tedious but I enjoy it so it's, it's not too bad. Mixing some of these reds now. That's a really strong. Uh, that's a opera pink that I'm using here, and so immediately I'm like, oh, that's that's too strong. So I'm dulling it back with blue and a little bit of yellow, and uh, because we're we're going into the distance here with this blue, I'm uh, I'm using cerulean and a touch of opera, but. Uh, I really want to get those nice mauve uh, violet colors that happen in the red of the rocks. Again, I'm working right on the edge here. I want to turn the corner or allow the viewer to see that that rock comes out and then rolls over, not in a real hard edge, but it's slightly, slightly soft. And if you look right now at the variety of color I have in here, you see that, gosh, I've just used everything. But in every instance, it's a combination of yellow, red, and blue. So if you look at my palette now in the mixing wells, you're going to see always red, yellow, and blue out in the mixing wells. Because I'm going to draw from those as I go back and forth to the paints. catch a little bit of the darts right here. You can see those lines that come down. And now, uh, you can also see how the, the dark edges lightened up as it dries. And so we have to continually uh, darkening that up. The old saying is, if, if you mix your color and get it just right in watercolor and put it down, it's wrong because it's going to dry lighter. So you have to overcompensate for, for that or continue to lay glazes on it till you get to the value that you want. So I'm starting to get these darks in here on the form shadow side. That feels like it turns a little bit better here. Just continue to work along here on these uh, the edge here, right up where it joins. This is the form shadow. So let's come up here now and uh, just touch in some of these dark areas. What I'm going to try to do is give some form to this uh, cliff that's adjacent to the Great White Throne and start to identify some of the uh, crevices and cracks and so forth, the shadow areas that we see in that. And mostly right now, to get that t turn, I'll put the color down, and then to get that uh, fold as it, as it goes over from uh, the light side or the light family to the shadow family, I'll put the pigment down, like I'm doing here, and then it helps to show that that turns over. Especially if I put the darks down and then use a little bit of, of clear water and soften the side towards the light, like right here. 
as I pull that down, I pull that shape all the way down, that side is softened. The left side, where it goes into the, uh, uh, where it's going to be, the cast shadow in a minute, that stays harder. And that just it shows these undulations and, and the fact that we're moving from the light surface to the shadow side. Yeah. This over here, I've, I'm going to, I'm still working on these, uh, just the, the surface of the rock in the various forms and shapes and I'm just kind of doing it at random not really looking that much at the photograph or even my my uh, value study I'm just doing what feels right uh, trying to get that texture down there get the shapes of the rocks in but um, the form shadows always warmer and the cast shadows always darker and so even though we can look at this painting right now and see the forms very well the next phase of this is, is just involving continuing to build up with glazes especially after one dries and put another over the top to build up these actual shapes that you see here this whole process takes some time I enjoy it I enjoy uh, working my way into the detail areas but still this whole painting is going to take less than two hours um, uh, you know, I'll have to speed up a little bit of it to, to get it all in uh, my one hour and ten minute time frame, which is what I try to shoot for with my with most all of my videos. And uh, the reason I do that is because I can't see how any human being is going to want to watch every boring stroke that I put on this. I have. Uh, I have artists write into me that say, no, no, show every single stroke. And I'm like, I can't believe it. anybody's going to want to watch every little part of this. I kind of would rather just see a 60-second uh, uh, speed painting of it and say, okay, I'm good. But uh, So I'm mixing up uh, some uh, colors here and even looking at my palette you can see that the variety that I have is there and I'm just saying okay where do I need to turn here where do I need to do next so I want to get some of the trees there's a whole patch of like a little forest of trees that's right up here in the crevice of this uh, rock it's a fairly prominent and significant part of the of the great white throne and so I'm laying that in, and I have to be careful. I know that there's uh, uh, pine trees up there, ponderosa pines and pinions. I can't just reach for my sap green. And they don't look like that when they're that far away. So I'm mixing a gray that has a green tinge to it. And that's what I'm uh, trying to achieve here, and that's why I'm kind of going with a little bit of an unsteady hand. I'm just trying to say, well, you know, is this too dark? Is this too light? Is this too green? Is it too blue? And I'm just trying to get some of that foliage into these areas where it uh, exists on this cliff. So this is what I would call detail, okay, to this point. This is detail. And uh, don't want to overdo it yet. I'm poking around here with it, but... I just, I've just got to be careful, not too bold, but to start laying some of these darks in there. You can see I'm using a smaller brush here. This is about a four, and uh, probably could still be using a bigger brush, but. Uh, you know, you just kind of get in the habit of what you do. So much of, uh, of paintings just reflect the artist's feeling for things and how our hand functions, how our eye sees, how our mind works, all that comes out. That's why 10 artists can go to the same place uh, and do plein air painting and see this huge variety of paintings that come out. You think, oh, they're going to all be the same. Well, they never are because uh, inside of you is just this kind of artist that's going to come out. The combination of, of your your head, your heart, and your hand is just going to kind of work its way out in time. 
but you've got to put in the the time. You've got to you've got to do the brush mileage, and you've got to just just do some paintings. Uh, my two sons have started painting now and they've been doing well in shows and that but I told them when they started that I said I want to see a hundred paintings when you get to a hundred paintings then I can help you with some stuff and they say well just help me now and I'll paint really good from the start well that's that's really not how it works you've got to get your experience at the point that you have some some reasonable questions that somebody can can help you with a teacher or a workshop or some of these videos that we do but none of it replaces hard work and painting hours you know get a hundred paintings under your belt that's a goal that I had those guys set for in one year do a hundred paintings and you're gonna learn so much that you're gonna have some good questions at that point but if you go to a workshop and you stay there for three or four days and you, 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 you watch the teacher paint, do demos each day, and you try a few things. Then you go home, you put your paints away, and you don't get anything out till the next workshop. And I have workshop students who do that. They say, you can't progress that way. You've got to be diligent and you've got to work at it. And you'll get a lot more out of doing 20 paintings than you will after going to 20 workshops. Get the painting mileage in and, uh, and the workshops are great but I say it's mostly entertainment. <laughs> so entertainment while you get better. So just get after it. Get those paintings in. So while I've been chatting here I, you can see I've been darkening up this this side down here below in the rock and, Gosh, it's starting to take shape beautifully, I think, uh, if I may say so. And uh, I think this, this painting coming along, that's a very majestic look to the cliff. And see how mellow those clouds had become when, as they began to dry and mold together. Just a nice, mellow glow to them. It's a wonderful technique uh, that I teach to, uh, in skies using those three colors and then letting the pigment blend on the paper. Whenever you can do that it's going to be a better mark than mixing a color on your palette and trying to just get it right. Let the pigments help you. A lot of time uh, we take the credit for what the pigment does by itself but we want that painting to look like the paint just jumped off the, the uh, palette and it just kind of moved itself around on the paper and, uh, and 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 did the work for you okay I'm just trying to think here where I want to go next and uh, just what I want to do I know I've got a lot of foreground to do and I'm kind of holding that off uh, for a little bit here at the end because uh, I'll be using some darks, and those darks in the foreground are always going to be darker than any darks back here where I'm working now in the form shadow. So uh, this is all taking shape very nicely, but you notice in the lower left corner there, I still have a lot more work to do on that rock, and also the uh, foreground rock that's... Uh, I've got to get that uh, much darker yet. So I think I'll get the cast shadow on the edge of this uh, where the great white throne uh, ad goes adjacent to the rock next to it. We have a little cast shadow from that uh, great white throne on that rock and that's going to be a little bluer and it's darker. Uh, your cast shadows are always darker than the form shadows. Just keep that in mind. So as we put this dark down, it'll give us the feeling that that, uh, that cliff is casting a shadow on the one next to it. I'll get it down here, take a look at it, and it may have to be darkened up in a minute as I go. Yeah, I'm feeling like it's not quite dark enough right now. Get 
this part right down here along the bottom and where it comes out it angles over so I can see that the photograph helps me with that your uh, reference photos can help you with some of the uh, some of the detail work and say well how does that form work and so forth well, your photos are a good help for that but not much help for anything else other than to get the, the details and the, the structure kind of right. If you're painting the Great White Throne, you're going to want it to look like the Great White Throne. You can't do too much uh, uh, freelancing with it and just say, no, nah, I think I'll do this here and there. You kind of got to keep it, keep it looking like it's supposed to. I'm poking around on this edge, trying to darken it up and pulling some of these uh, darks that I feel are in that form shadow down. But I really like how this is coming together at this point. I think it's just, uh, uh, I think it's great. And so, uh, again, I'm just evaluating. If you get this kind of right, and then I'm going to move down into this lower, in the more foreground part of it. And that's where I've got some detail to work. And, that's where I'll have to go in just a minute. So down at the bottom, this kind of forms sort of a foothill as it angles out, the rock angles out towards the canyon floor. So need to get that and kind of at least as dark as what the uh, the other form shadow is. These would be trees and uh, foliage and rocks and things but I still have a foreground uh, tree that I'm going to put in on the left and I plan for in my thumbnail study and uh, that's going to really give us a feeling of foreground, middle ground and distance as I work on that. So let's get a little bit of this laid in behind it, and then I'll start the work on that tree in the foreground. Just using a mixture of colors here, uh, just to kind of get it dark. Probably doing a little more detail than I need right here, since it's going to be mostly hidden behind this other tree, but um, I don't want to have to go back into it after. As I bring the darkest darks in, I want them to lay over the top of these, uh, of the other colors. So, continuing to bring this tone down. I'm excited how this is coming. I like that it's feeling good to me. It's feeling powerful. It's, it's rich with color, but not too rich. It's about typical of most of my paintings, which are very warm. But um, I'm really anxious to get down uh, into this foreground and finish this painting up. I have to go a little bit at a time. Again, I, I, can't, I can't think why anyone would want to watch this part of it, but uh, so many people do hundreds and hundreds of people write in and say, oh no, we want to see every little part, and I just can't imagine that, uh, you know, I like to see other people paint too, but, you know, not for an hour, <laughs> or two hours, so, uh, you know, hopefully I can uh, speed this up a little bit, and just have you still see, see where we're headed with.
So now let's uh, let's start on some of this foreground, and I'm gonna uh, just. I don't know if there's much to describe about this, but you can see I'm mixing some really dark darks. Um, I'm, I'm using some cornacridone sienna and actually a little bit of phthalo blue, which is a very, very dark dark. It's also a really intense color that you have to dull it back with red, which I'm doing here. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, just kind of create the uh, some foreground and you can you'll be able to see now as I work on this that we we're moving from the foreground to the middle ground to the distance and this will help complete the frame in the, but also give the viewer a place to step into the painting and uh, move back in in space with it uh, I'm, I'm painting mostly in a positive way which is using dark over light to create the positive shape of the tree but as I work, I'm going to um, kind of try to build in a few little uh, negative shapes as well by painting the darks and leaving uh, some light trunks here and there or branches. Uh, right now, all we see is this dark line, and we assume then that that's a branch or that that's a trunk or something like that. But if we if we bring our darks. Uh, if we place our darks in such a way that we're leaving a, a space in between those, instead of becoming a positive shape, it becomes a negative shape. And uh, you know, so right now, this is a positive painting. It's not too complicated because it's going to cover up whatever uh, is lighter that's behind it. So I didn't have to preserve space for it or preserve any whites or lights but I can as I continue to work this. I have just a little more red in there instead of the green. And I'm just kind of making this up as I go, so we'll see how it, how it works out. Again, I'm using this low Cornell brush, and uh, has a good point on it. Uh, I like the synthetics because they're a little bit stiffer, has have a little more snap to it. The um, the very expensive Kolinsky sables are, are, are nice, and they last for a long time. They hold a lot of paint, but they're just too floppy for me. Um, it just uh, I don't know. The Kolinsky doesn't doesn't do it for me. I like a little more snap, a little stiffer um, feeling to the the brush, so I can get these nice uh, little shapes. So what I'm doing now is I'm I'm shaping the darks. To, I'm painting the darks to create the lighter shapes, which will be give the viewer an idea that maybe there's some lighter branches coming in the foreground in front of it, but again, I'm just uh, winging this, so we'll see. I indicated something there in my values study, but there's really no reference, so I'm just doing whatever I want to. I hope you can see those little that trunk and those little branches as they're coming up against the dark background. I'll just build that out a little bit with some of the trees behind it, and just kind of keep things uh, keep things going here. But this is where I get anxious on a painting to kind of dive in and wrap it up. Um, this uh, this delicate painting that I'm doing now, more calligraphic or uh, more line quality because of the branches and leaves and things, uh, that belongs in the foreground. That doesn't belong in the middle or, or background distance. And the darks, the darkest darks against lightest lights are up in the foreground. The values are more similar as you move further back in space because of 
the law of receding values, or aerial perspective, as they call it sometimes. Uh, and that's a valuable tool to use as well in your paintings to create the drama of space and distance. So right now, as we get these, these darks going in here, um, I'm just going to you just have to watch as I just kind of say, well, I need a little something here, I need a little something there. <laughs> it, not, no, not any particular formula to it, just seeing what looks good. We can really see at this point, you know, it, the, the painting literally looks finished right now. Anything I do now is just going to be darkening up a few darks here and there to create some contrast where we need it, trying to uh, put the detail in, not too much, but just enough to stay with the, the realist style that I'm using. You know, I just right now I'm just poking around with these cracks and the, the distant cliffs and it's kind of a you know I'm really there a lot of times I'll get a painting to this point and uh, you know just set it aside just set it aside for a, a little while maybe a day or so and just uh, bring it back and take another look at it and a lot of times with a fresh eye you can say Oh geez, I need this whole area over here, or I this is too dark on this place, or this is, is too light, and I need something over here. Or, uh, I forgot this whole area of shadow that needs to go in there. So sometimes, uh, after staring at a painting for a couple of hours, you want to move away from it and come back and and uh, just with a fresh eye take another look at it and see what you got. So it's time to evaluate right now. I'm just trying to look at this and say, okay, where do I go next? Um, this is the part of the painting where you, instead of shutting out, you just keep messing with it. And, and it doesn't add anything to it, really. It just, uh, it's really a good time to set things aside and just reevaluate later. But I like the rocks. I think they're complete. I'm just a little uncomfortable with the foreground here on the right. I need to feel like it needs something more to to bring those forward. At the same time, I don't want to draw attention away from the tree on the left. So I'm kind of just kind of stewing around with it. Making these little tiny strokes. Sometimes I get after my students and say, you're diddling with it, quit diddling, and they like to use that and watch me paint and say, you're diddling, and I say, you're yeah, exactly right, <laughs> time, to, time to set it aside and, and uh, come back later or just put a little mat on it and see what you got. Okay, I've been dying to do this now for a while. Let's just grab a mat. I keep some handy all the time and lay it right on top of here. And let's just see what, what this is going to look like. Did we do it? Did we get it done? That's what this tells us. And I like it. I think it's good. Well, I want to thank you for joining me here in the studio today for this painting. And uh, I think it came along pretty well. You know, you never really know how they're going to turn out until you get there. 
but I like the feel of this painting and, and uh, I hope the client that it's for is going to be happy with it as well. But I appreciate you coming by. You know, everybody does uh, their paintings differently, really. Uh, you can learn a little bit by watching from other people, but the real key, the real key to it is to paint and paint and paint. Brush mileage, we call it. And it, you can't really get the answers to your questions until you have the question. So you're not going to know what to ask until you start painting. And that's when the answers can come. And that's when uh, having a, a mentor or a tutor can really help you. But for now, the main thing is that you just need to paint. And the more you paint, the better you're going to get. And yes, you should go to shows. You should enter shows. You could go look at what other people are doing. But still, it's all going to come to you as you put in the time, the brush mileage, and make it work for you. And there's, there's something inside of you that's going to come out your own way. You can't paint like somebody else. You're only going to paint like yourself. But uh, you have to be happy with that, I know. But that's what's going to happen, and that happens naturally. So keep on painting. That's my uh, advice to you. Thanks for joining me today. And uh, come back and see me again. I'm Roland Lee.